Okay, welcome to the very first uh, marine invertebrate slideshow. And you'll get quite used to using these slideshows and video recordings uh, as we go through the course. I'll apologize uh, right now um, and let you know that there is sometimes a cutout as you go from slide to slide with this PowerPoint recording. So I'll try to make a break in my voice and you'll just have to bear with it in between slides. And you'll notice the, um, from this uh, picture of this beautifully colored wall that um, it is in incredibly diverse. We've got a couple of scuba divers going by it. It's taken from the aldermans. And one of the um, differences between a terrestrial environment where 90% of the things growing in a forest are going to be plant is that 90% of what you see growing on this wall is animal and 10% uh, would be algae. And we will be exploring the diversity of these. So when you go diving, you'll be able to understand the ecology of what you're looking at and how the different organisms that you're seeing uh, exist and thrive in that habitat. So we'll have a little look at all the diversity of the uh, type of invertebrates that you're going to see in this year, starting with this uh, sea tulip, which is like a sea squirt on a stick. And here are some, uh, there's a beautiful sponge. You can see it's named as porifera, which is pore bearer. And you can see that from all the holes that are in it. Here is um, an, like an encrusting sponge and sponge diversity. The sponge diversity is, uh, is incredible, um, starting with those encrusting sponges right up to things like the tube sponge and these giant barrel sponges. Phylum Cnidaria, which is jellyfish, hydras, um, anemones, and corals. So this isn't actually a real size jellyfish. This is a Photoshop doctored photo, but jellyfish do get this big. And uh, these ones are gonna be eaten. They're gonna be um, dried out, fried, and eaten right down to our little uh, tiny little zoanthids like so and hydrozoans which are even smaller we've got soft coral which have polyps that look like this and our local little uh, red warata anemones and um, our beautiful tropical corals of course that build the world's largest biogenic structures collectively uh, into structures like the coral reef, the Great Barrier or Coral Reef. If that doesn't make you want to go snorkeling and diving, nothing will. Phylum Echinodermata, all of our sea stars and urchins. This one is a brittle star. Here's a lovely um, red and gray colored uh, a sea star. You can see the diversity of these things. There are many, many colors, shapes, sizes. Local um, 11 arm star, local cushion star, and here's a crown of thorns starfish. Um, probably heard of these dealing to uh, uh, coral reefs around the world as predators have been removed. A local snapper biscuit or sand dollar, and here's a lovely little sea cucumber. Can be worth hundreds of dollars a kilo um, for making soup. Here's a sea urchin, a kinna. Uh, we'll move on to the phylum mollusca. These are our snail and slug like things, including a baby cuttlefish. Weird deep sea creatures like this that we don't even uh, know what it is. We've only seen them once or twice in um, uh, in deep diving submersibles or unmanned robots taking just happening to walk wander across them and and, um, and take photos abalone like a this isn't a uh, local power but it is a type of abalone and you can see the holes at the top that you should be familiar with if you are familiar with power shells things like scallops where you can see many, many eyes. This is a typical bivalve or two shell. 
and we'll learn a lot about these. We eat a lot of these things like pippies. Uh, they're quite a resource for us. There's one of the main re type of uh, bivalves that we use as a resource. We also have the gastropods, which are crawling snails, marine snails. Um, here we have a vampire snail. I'll tell you all about this relationship in um, class, but it is sucking blood off of a sleeping parrotfish. Here we have a nudibranch. Um, you'll see many, many, many types of these while you're diving, and they are often some of our students' very favorite animals. We move on to the annelids, the earthworms, the polychaetes, and the leeches. They can be really big, or they can be very small. This is a little Christmas tree worm living inside a coral polyp. And this is its filter, filter feeding appendages, which all, will be all you'll ever see of this worm unless you dig it out. We'll move to the arthropods. Um, we'll focus on crustaceans mostly because arthropods include insects as well as the, um, the, um, the crabs and lobsters and the things that we tend to see underwater. Here's the type, one of the types of arthropods that we're often quite interested in. And also lots of little, little crabbies like this, little cute. Copepods, which are probably the most important uh, link between um, fish and, zo uh, sorry, phytoplankton or algal plankton in the uh, entire marine environment and all sorts of strange diversity in the arthropods. They're the most successful, most diverse group of animals on the planet. Barnacles are also arthropods. Um, we'll be looking at different body plans and you'll be able to see how even something like this, the, you can tell similarities between its body plan and a crayfish. Um, and we'll be exploring all of these different phyla these different types of animals in, our, in this marine invertebrates class. Uh, here we have another um, nudibranch in the middle, but feeding on it, or, or what it's feeding on, um, what looks like a plant at the top is actually a um, colony of animals called bryozoans or lace corals. There's more lace corals at the top and something called brachiopods, which are evolutionary throwbacks. They've been around for 450 million years. And you can see the little um, filter feeding structure on the inside of the shell. They look like a bivalve, but they're a completely separate phylum. Very interesting little animals. And finally, finally phylum chordata. So the, even though you might think these are sponges, they're actually much more closely related to us human beings than would be a fish, or sorry, not a fish, than would be a, um, like a, uh, an arthropod or any of the other types of inverts that we'll be looking at. Sea squirts. Um, and we'll be also looking at some other phyla like the ribbon worms and the tenophores that um, you'll see uh, in other habitats. And especially while you're um, doing your safety stops, drifting by will be a huge diversity of different types of uh, animals. So at the end of the class, you'll be able to recognize all of these animals and tell what phylum they're in and how they fit into their habitat. So let's see, if we're going to start looking at what an animal is and what an invertebrate is, first we have to know um, what life is. Uh, we don't have many chances to uh, look into the origin and the diversity of life um, in this program. So this is just going to be a quick run through to get you thinking about it. And hopefully you'll find it interesting enough to um, 
go and do some further reading on your own. So what makes something alive? So if we have some material, like a piece of steel, is it alive? Probably most people would say no. What if it reprodu reproduces? Is it now alive? Or if it grows, if it reproduces and grows, is it alive? Many people would say, of course, it's alive now. But, but crystals can grow and reproduce, and they are in, organized into patterns, but they're not considered to be alive. Glass, for example. Um, so something like organization, where you have a cell wall, metabolism, where food goes in and is converted, energy is extracted from it, and waste is going out. Uh, these types of things also are important for a living organism. And they also need to be able to respond to stimuli. So, um, for example, a, a single-celled amoeba is often going to be negatively um, uh, attracted, sorry, it will be attracted to dark rather than light. It's repelled by light, so they will crawl away from a light source. Homeostasis, and they have to be able to maintain a uh, environment within the cell that is different to the environment outside of the cell. And you can see in this example that there's a large concentration of um, particles, perhaps it's a salt particle, on the outside of the cell and a lesser concentration on the inside of the cell. And we maintain um, a much higher level of hydration within our bodies than outside of the bodies. That's called homeostasis, or keeping something the same. All of these different uh, considerations need to be uh, evident for something to be considered alive. So now you know what life is, let's move on. So how did life get started on Earth? Um, there are many different theories of how life got started on Earth. Nobody has explained it. Uh, that's all we really need to say. Um, there are a lot of people who've stuck um, ideas in, decided that it must be one way or the other without uh, any clear evidence that it was any particular way. Uh, in science, we like to deal with evidence and make conclusions based on what is falsifiable and what we can um, show is the most likely. However, uh, there are many thousands of resources and many thousands of websites, videos that will um, give you a clue as to what people are thinking on this uh, subject. Well, what we do know is that three and a half to 3.8 billion years ago, that's billion with a B, many, many, many years ago, single-celled, very simple, uh, prokaryotic, that means no organelles within the cell, very, very simple cells um, existed, came into being, started reproducing somehow. Um, and that type of stuff is still the most successful stuff on the planet. Viruses, and which are not considered to be alive, but bacteria um, will probably make up half of all the biomass in the ocean. They way, way, way outnumber us. And, uh, you know, like in terms of your own weight, probably 10 to 12 percent of what you weigh is uh, explained by the bacteria within your body. Uh, viruses could be 10 to 100 million per teaspoon of seawater. They're just, they are way more successful than we are, and they'll be around much longer than we will on this planet. So for the first 700,000 years, there was um, 
this kind of stuff, single-celled stuff, and then uh, this kind of stuff, where uh, cells group together to help share with resources and organization and become more efficient organisms in terms of extracting resources and reproducing. The first evidence of multicellular life forms 570 million years ago. And we have lots of um, information in the fossil record uh, in the pre-Cambrian era era where we saw uh, a diverse of, where we saw a diversity of very soft bodied organisms growing and these things would have been small for the most part 10 15 centimeters above the ground things like um, sea pens jellyfish these very soft bodied organisms would have developed and you can find um, the outlines and the body shapes of these things in deposits from that time. So um, they radiated out into all of the environments in the world and uh, started to grow and diversify. But if you think about it, we've had multicellular life for less than 10% of all the time the Earth has been uh, going around the sun. And for ourselves, for human beings, over the 150,000 years, we are just arrived. So what we now have in terms of diversity is five commonly known kingdoms of um, organisms on the planet. Uh, it's more like eight, but uh, in terms of simplicity, this is what is generally um, used in sort of the intro level biology. Uh, we start with the Monera, which are the simple celled or single celled um, non uh, organelle bearing organisms. Protists would be single celled or loosely grouped, and they are um, they they have a more complex interior of the cell. Uh, fungi are multicellular, and they absorb material. Or they uh, they essentially um, digest food outside of the body and then absorb it, the nutrients. Uh, plants absorb nutrients and they photosynthesize and are multicellular. And then animals are multicellular and they eat other things. So what is an animal? It is multicellular and heterotrophic. A heterotroph is an organism that cannot synthesize its own food. It's dependent on complex organic substances for nutrition. So... It, you could say the same thing about fungi, um, but fungi or fungi absorb food from outside of themselves, whereas um, animals consume that food and then digest it within. But anyway, animals eat other organisms. So evolution, what is evolution and how does it work? All right. This we could spend months and months on. You could do an evolutionary biology class. You could do a doctorate with evolutionary biology. Um, we're going to go through it very quickly. This is a great um, quote because if you can't understand evolution, then you really can't understand biology. Uh, in order to understand why any feature of any organism exists, you have to understand why it gives that animal an advantage, and that is evolutionary theory. So, there are five different um, sentences that you can use to explain evolution. And remember, in Darwin's day, there was no such thing as 
uh, knowledge of genes or DNA or anything. So you don't actually need to know anything about genetics or, um, or genes in order to understand evolution. You just have to understand these five um, sentences. In reproduction, all the organisms reproduce similar descendant organisms. You'll notice the baby lion cub here doesn't look like a penguin or a giraffe or an amoeba. It looks like a lion. Okay, so organisms, when they give birth, give birth to things that look like themselves. And they generally will, if uh, they live long enough, animals will give birth to way more descendants than can actually survive. There isn't enough, there aren't enough resources for the, for all of the uh, babies to survive. And within those babies, there is going to be some variation. They'll all look like lions if they're lion cubs. They'll all look like human beings if they're humans, but there's going to be a lot of variation between the different individuals within that population. So because there are so many offspring produced, and because there are limited resources within the within the environment, those different individuals with different traits will have to compete for the resources that are available. It could be that they're competing within individual within their own species, as the two deer competing for mates, which are a limited resource, or um, they could be competing between species, where you see this chipmunk or hedgehog or groundhog or whatever it is um, competing with these birds for an acorn. And then anyway, those ones, those individuals of the population who have um, advantageous traits that allow them to um, be successful in that competition for resources, will compete more successfully, breed more successfully, and leave more descendants in that environment. And eventually, the traits that they have that have helped them compete will spread throughout the population. That's evolution. So what is a species? What makes a species? A species is a genetically distinct group that share a common gene pool and are reproductively isolated from other groups. So what does that mean? That means that if you have two organisms and they can breed together and make an offspring, are they a species? Not necessarily, because this is a picture of a zorse, which is a horse and a zebra crossing. They've made an offspring, but that offspring is not going to be able to reproduce itself. So it is a sterile thing, like, much like a horse and a donkey make a mule, or a lion and a tiger make a liger, or a, a, a tie-on, either one of those. But um, So what me, makes them different species is that even if they can reproduce, they can't reproduce viable offspring. And so that means that they are reproductively isolated and therefore separate species. Okay. An interesting thing about evolution is that it implies we all have a common ancestor. We share a common ancestor with a tree, with a bacteria, with a horse, with a, a lizard, with monkeys, with every type of um, organism that's alive on the planet and all the other ones that have gone extinct all come from a... a a common ancestor. All right. And it's very apparent that um, there is commonality when you start looking at the organisms um, from a genetic standpoint, from an evolutionary or from a geological standpoint, from uh, using comparative biology. And um, there's uh, a very clear picture of, of the way in which humans and other animals have descended through the um, geological time. This is um, Charles Darwin who came up with the theory. Alfred Wallace also came up with the theory independently 
wrote to Charles Darwin, and Charles Darwin said, oh, I better publish my stuff uh, before Wallace actually uh, publishes his. They both came up with it independently. Charles Darwin just happened to publish his first. Uh, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck is a the first of a long line of people who have tried to come up with other theories for the um, uh, or, or other modifications to to how humans may have arrived on the planet. And um, so what he did was try to uh, prove that inherited traits could be passed on to um, the offspring by cutting off the tails of 50 generations of mice. And when the 51st generation of mice was born with tails, he realized that no inherited, uh, char or, sorry, acquired characteristics were not going to be passed on as inherited char characteristics. So is does everybody agree with evolution? No. Criticisms of evolution include things like, if we evolved from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? And why aren't monkeys evolving into people today? And so everything blew up and all this just happened by chance. What about irreducible complexity? So this is the um, intelligent design, uh, intelligent design sort of uh, theories. Um, well, there are um, very clear scientific answers to all of these. Um, all of these can be explained very easily. Um, if we evolved from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? We didn't evolve from the species of monkey that um, are around today. We have a common ancestor with them. And monkeys aren't evolving into people today because uh, there's no uh, selective pressure to be evolving into people. And no, everything didn't happen by chance. It happened through evolution, which is a very different uh, prospect. Irreducible complexity. I've given you links to um, creationist and um, ID uh, websites. And you, I encourage you to go and explore those ideas. Um, one thing I would say is you don't have to agree with evolution with this class, but you do have to understand it and as how it works as and its mechanism in order to get a decent grade.